Let's do it. Let's do it. Let's do it. What's up, baby? We're back at it. One year. Same place. What up, my dog? What you? <laughs> Why? You don't like my outfit? Well, here we are, fellas. The one year anniversary of the official start of The Pivot. We get an opportunity to thank all the people that have supported us, but also the people behind the scenes who have done all the work, all the opportunities that we've had to reach out to our guests, we get to thank them, but also our partners, John Shahidi, Sam Shahidi, the folks over at Happy Dad who have been with us since day one. Sir. Got an opportunity to work with DraftKings as well, prize picks. But we can never say that we didn't have people support us from day one. So whether it was Full Sin, whether it's Happy Dad, who we went on tour with in Nashville, we got to be grateful for that. So we're going to get an opportunity to take you all through our year, give you all a few clips that we love, some laughs. We won't cry. But again, let's pop a Happy Dad, man. Cheers to a year, my guys. I done drank a lot of these. <laughs> <laughs> now let's start the show. Hold up. Limitless. Take a stem and cap in it. I thought they hear the witness it. Got my people feeling militant. Way I'm feeling, get me up. Uh, on the mission, get me up. Uh, knowing me, I got the key. Uh, on the vision, I can trust. Uh, trust. Uh, limitless. Take a stem and cap in it. I thought they hear the witness it. Got my people feeling militant. Uh, way I'm feeling, get me up. Uh, on the mission, get me up. Uh, the Pivot has been alive for a year. We're in the exact same place that it started. I'm not really sure why we came back, because if, if we remembered right, all the doors open constantly here. Yeah. I, I never thought we was actually going to release a show. <laughs> when you look back on this year, man, did you ever expect for us to be at this point? Speaking cockily? I don't think that's, that's a, word. a word. That's probably not a word like candleism, which you use on ESPN. <laughs> I like my words. My, my, I'm a wordsmith. But just the cocky of it, everything you touch is going to turn to gold. That's what you want to say. And that's what I honestly want to say. Hey, man, we had this idea it was going to blow up. I had no idea how fast. I knew it could, but I had no idea how fast. And just walking in to it and being a part of dudes I knew as humans, but didn't really know as business partners, didn't really know as what we're going to be, how long we're going to be around each other, how much we're going to be around each other. It was, uh, it was exciting, but to say that I was like, yeah, at the year mark, we're going to be where we are now, the deals we're getting now, the numbers we have now, the, you know, the viewership and all, I would have never said yes. I mean, it's, it's, it's so many unknowns, man. You know, but for each of them, I'm grateful. Um, you know, just the conversation Channing and I had when we were trying to figure out what we were going to do in terms of leaving you know, the last situation. You know, we had a couple moments where we was like, nah, let's, we're good, let's chill. But then we also had those moments like, you know what? Fuck that. We can do our own thing and we can do it better. And I remember, you know, just, it seems like it was yesterday, uh, just, just really how those phone calls came together, talking with Alicia, talking with Chan, trying to figure out, you know, um, who that other person would be. And uh, just just really getting to that moment where we just started ironing everything out. Things just started to feel better. You can kind of see everything started to uh, take shape from the breakfast on La Solas, you know, to the phone <laughs> call. You, yeah. you know, just putting you on the speaker there and just, just having those conversations. And now we're here. Now we're here. It's crazy. Yeah, I can't say uh, I truly understood it. You know, I've always done network t TV at the time. I was doing my own podcast because I wanted to work on being able to interview people and carry conversations. And I was just so bored with what I was being asked to do every day. You know, we talk about it all the time. I love football and it's easy to watch it and it's easy to talk about it. But this was this was a challenge. And I think the, the bigger challenge was going to be chemistry, was going to be like how dudes get along. You know, Channing always mentions it like it's, it's lying, sitting down to have a conversation. But I think all the times that one of us took a back seat to the other, or two of us took a back seat 
to the other. Whatever it was, I feel like in every moment, we've all tried to at least, to the best of our abilities, be what we needed to be for this show to be great. And I think it shows in the way that people follow us. I think in the impact that we've had, man. And I'm so grateful for this year. You spoke about the conversations, but it was about making the pivot. Right. And when it came down time to pick a name, that's the name we pick. And we pick the colors. And then Alicia sends the text messages and she's like, okay, what does it mean to you? And we kind of all settle in on, you know, accept, adjust, and move forward. And that's exactly what we've done at each and every turn. But we hear that word so much and now hearing it means something different, not only to us, but to everybody else. Every time you hear that word or you or someone uses it around you, Chan, what's the feeling you get knowing it's something, not that we started, because the word's always been here, but something that we've brought so much attention to. It's prideful, it really is, you know. Knowing about the show when somebody yells, hey, love the show, hey, love the pod, hey, love this episode, that one, that feels good. But really, like you said, just have, making a word that's been around for centuries when they turned Latin into damn English, whatever it was, and making it mean more than that. Simple word, you know, five letters. And just to your point on radio shows, anything I do, if the word is said, People look at you, mm -hmm. people will giggle, people will say something. So to make a five letter simple word into a movement, I guess, yeah. if you want to say it, like it's wild to me and it, it comes with a lot of pride. I'm not gonna lie. I'm gonna get back to pivot, but what you said just, you know, it won't go away, man. Uh, you say the one big challenge for you was our chemistry, which is crazily our, our greatest asset. You know, gotta deal with this motherfucker. You know, not in a bad way. Like Channing lights up. He he brings the 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 life to the pod. You got skin from my butt on there. Yeah, right. booty foot. You got a booty foot. When I was eight, I set my house on fire, and when I ran in the room, a toy blew up on my foot, and my foot was on fire coming up my leg. So I ran and jumped in the pool, but I had third degree burns, so they had to take a big patch off my butt cheek and put it on my foot. It's called a skin grab. This shit happens all the time. It's, it this does is happen. New. So you got a patch in your booty. I got a patch of my booty on my foot, and I got a little shiny patch on my booty, too. <laughs> that there that is so grab. disgusting. Like, why is your butt so dark? But do you see the hair, the long hair, Reg? Right? Yes, that's booty hair, bro. Isn't that cool? That's not cool. You want to touch the hair, Fred? Could you imagine? Nah, could you imagine having a patch of skin on your body that is both butt cheek and toe? Kiss my ass. Man, listen, y'all don't appreciate my ass foot. And uh, you, on the other hand, you know, the articulation and, and being able to button up, you know, and, and it starts with your fashion sense, obviously. Which is today phenomenal, too, by the way, for the year show, Chan. Look ridiculous. I don't look ridiculous. You look like the final boss in a Sega game. <laughs> <laughs> hey, what's the dude inside of the hedgehog? Like the last, the, the last, the last dude inside of the hedgehog, like the Oracle. Yes. You're a Sonic Oracle. See man. what I'm saying? You see how smooth that transition was? <laughs> and it wasn't done on purpose, man. But uh, that's why I appreciate you guys. And I'm, I'm just thankful and grateful to be a part of it. But uh, just back to the word pivot. You know, coming out of the pandemic itself, everybody on the planet had to pivot. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and each and every year, much like we did when we started this, going into that new year, you got to pivot. You know, you got to figure out which direction you know, you want your life to flow. You know, whether you can prepare for that or not, it's gonna be a pivot. We don't un understand how big that, that, that word is. We understand that there's a movement. We hear it all the time. People talk about how, you know, we've helped their lives, how we've, we've helped change their lives. And, and, and it's not always on purpose, but I think that uh, with everything, it's been probably the most purposeful pivot that I've, been a part of in my life, because now that I, I, I recognize how much it does help free people, I get so excited to hop on that plane and go make it happen. <laughs> Man, it, it's been a blessing, bro. And talking about the pivot now, speaking about that word and how we had to, had to adjust, right? And the chemistry thing, just thinking about it. As to where it was something, we went to Tampa, we were on the training camp tour, and we went with Leonard Fournette. Mm -hmm. And being a Louisiana dude, LSU guy, you knew him. And so we know we try to fill out the guys on the way. And we've said this 
phrase in so many words with different, you know, different relations we have with people. And you remember you told me, and he was like, yeah, Lenny, cool. He's like, he's like one of us. And thinking about back when I called you the first time, when we were talking, and Alicia, and we were all getting together, I'm like, let me shit, let's hit RC. And all the Steelers I know, I'm cool with a bunch of Steelers, Footy and Pot and, and, and Peasy and all them boys, C-Hamp. And everybody was always like, RC's a solid dude. But I never was around you like that. Then you saw TV, you, and it was like, okay, so you kind of had an idea of how you were. And then it was before we kind of, you know, coined the phrase around us. But after we got off the phone, we talked for like two hours that first night. I hit Freddie right after. He was like, RC in? I was like, RC, R R RC, he he's down. You know, yep. he's down to see what he can do. He's like, he's straight. I would have said he's like us if I had that phrase in the moment. But I was right. like, no, nah, he's solid. He's just what I thought he was. Right. And it was funny from the first second, the first conversation. Like, it was just, it was natural. It fell in line. Obviously, we had some some growing pains yeah. throughout the way. Like, you talking about sitting here that first time. We didn't know what the hell we was doing. Yeah, I, I, I legitimately thought the show sucked. Like, I, <laughs> I, remember, I remember leaving the first show, and, like, a lot of people don't know that we did Plexico Burris here the first night. First, first And night. it was a show we put out months later because we thought we were so terrible. And we were upset because we understood the story that Plexico had, but I was like, we didn't do it the right way. And we were talking over each other and we're amening everything. Like we're in a Southern Baptist church and Alicia's like, y'all can't do that. That messes up the audio. And I'm like, well, shoot, I don't know. You know, like I want everything to be a conversation. And you know, then we get to Nyjah and we've shot five shows or whatever it was in LA. I shot a commercial that day and we go there and we're prepared and we're terrible. You know, and I'm thinking to myself, like, I don't know how this is going to work. And quiet is kept. You know, we could be truthful. At the time, we are competing against your guys' former podcast that was already established. Yeah. Right? And no matter how we wanted to say that it wasn't a competition, people were always going to compare. And so there was that stress. And you're going through all these things, and it's like, okay, we're going through our own individual pivots as humans and as a group. But I think the coolest thing was we've been able to share in and so many people that support us have shared their pivots, which is the most important thing. Yeah, I really have something Hit me with a question. that I want to end with because I think you made the biggest pivot. What's your message to the young Bruce that had the gender dysmorphia, yeah, the identity problem? What's your biggest message to them? Don't be in a rush, number one. Um, it's not easy to do. It affects a lot of people. Do what's right for you. Every journey is different. Mine's so different, but it still happens. And just be smart. This, it's not a rush. It's not like it's all gotta happen right now. You gotta just, you gotta know that this is the right thing to do. And don't silence yourself. And I mean by Suicide is big. The big pivot moment where you know you had boxing in the bag and um, you know there was a whole nother side to it. What was that pivot moment that said, I can do this shit? Like, I am the show. Once I said, I'm no longer gonna be just an athlete. I'm gonna be a businessman. We're in a state where everybody wants to understand what's going on with you. In doing my job, people are constantly trying to tell me that you're crazy. And I often tell them, I was like, he's smart. He understands what's going on. I said, and he knows who he wants Antonio Brown to be. So for the people that think you have lost control, what would be your message to them about you? Nah, I'm glad you asked that question because, you know, people, you know, fear what they don't understand and they try to marginalize you when they think how you're supposed to be. I served a suspension in 2014, and that was the longest suspension in Major League Baseball history for PD use. And that was, that, was the, that was the blow that I thought was gonna take me out, right? That was like the blow that landed, right? And, and it was such a, such a humiliating uh, part of my life because I let down so many people. Started with my mother and my two daughters first and foremost. And that was a perfect example of, of overreaching and surrounding myself with the wrong people. When I see the name Pivot, I'm thinking about pivoting. I pivot. I made an unbelievable pivot in life. Mm -hmm. It's gonna be people that y'all gonna educate the pivot. Y'all educating people about that. Y'all y'all having great conversations with legends. I'm talking about legends, people that, some of the greatest people that ever walked this, this life. Y'all creating a mindset shift for people that watch this and be like, oh shit, 
That's what I could do. Charles Barkley was the MVP. So my question is. And the is, better players were not Charles Barkley. <laughs> Well, this is my no, Fred. Hey, like, let's be like, hey, nah, you want to bring it up? Bring it up. There were better players than Charles Barkley running around on that goddamn team. Hey, there was only one mother. Who? Michael. So that's just you were the second best player on that. Hell yeah. You were the second best player on the dream team, Chuck. Go back and look. Go back and check. I get to my point then. Go ahead, please. You know, RC. Just, just thinking to it, man. And Channing, you know, he always said the people. The people is what, what make the podcast. You know, the guests getting here, allowing the guests to be the guests. Mm. You know, letting them talk, letting them tell their story because it goes back to what you said. It's the people. Mm. The people want to hear from them. So regardless of how bad we thought we sucked that first uh, episode we shot, it, it, it comes back to the people. You know, uh, for example, Michael Beasley. You know, him telling his story. And I'm pretty sure you guys have your own favorites and you know, you can go back and, and, and see which one touched you the most. But, you know, just telling that story, I think that's when the pivot became really the pivot. ascended and became the pivot. That was the ultimate pivot for me. They laughed at me every, like, like every step of the way, right? Like, every step of the way. My mom died and they laughed. Like, you ever watch somebody die? I watched the last breath. You dig what I'm saying? I watched the last breath, like... We buried her on January 1st. I get back on January the 4th, I want to say. I wake up the next day, I find out my cousin James died. So now I got to go downstairs and tell him, like, yo, I might got to leave again because my, you know what I'm saying? And, and at this point, I'm like, bro, so many people dying. I'm starting to think they, this fate, you know what I'm saying? I don't want them to think I'm, I just don't want to play basketball or nothing. So I went to him reluctantly, like, bro, yo, my cousin died and I might have to go to the funeral. And that was the day before Oklahoma. So I'm sitting there for two days just like trying to trying to figure out if I'm going to leave, I'm, I'm going to leave, I'm going to go. Is there anybody to talk to in season when something like that's going on? No. no. There's nobody on the team to talk to. There's nobody to express that to. When I was growing up, like, whatever you was going through, anything you was going through was just, like, it, it, it wasn't mental health. It wasn't he crying out for help. It wasn't nothing other than, oh, it's just distracting him from basketball. That's your problem. That's your problem. It's distracting him from basketball. You dig what I'm saying? So, like, nah, I had nobody to fucking talk to. And every time I tried to talk to somebody, it was just always, oh, oh, he crazy. That's crazy. Bees. That's just, oh, he just crazy, crazy. But I think you, you speaking about the ultimate pivot, I think the, the first decision that was big was obviously we took care of business. And then once business was situated, we started to talk about how do we make this show different? And you have a family in a busy schedule. You have a family in a busy schedule. I have a family in a busy schedule. Alicia at the time was doing so many different shows. She's the matriarch basically of her family. and She's dealing with all those things. And we all said, we're gonna travel. Right, we're, we're gonna do our best to move around as much as we possibly can because we understood, we, we, we started this thing like we were playing from a deficit, right? We were like, nah, we're behind where we want to be and we haven't shot a show. And we decided that we're gonna travel. And so we shoot the shows here and then I have a bowl game. And you know, I can let the people know that I have great partners and it was like, okay, we know RC works a lot. We're gonna do our best, at least during the season, to be in places where he can be or he could get to easily. So we go to Vegas and we were laughing about this the other day. We shot Jordan and, and Marvin, Marvin Lewis. You know, that, that, that was our second guess. Yeah. You know, and for me it was dope, because it's my kid. Yeah. Right, but, but we're in Vegas and we're like, okay, we're gonna scramble and get everybody we possibly can. Fred finds out that Marshawn Lynch is at an event, he goes over and he does that, right? We, we get Jordan and Marv to sit down. But then, and the one thing about the pivot, man, that I respect is that we ain't petty and we ain't messy. Yeah. So I'm not gonna name names of people that stand us up. It's late in Vegas. We've been out there the entire day. Uh, we had a guest set up at the Pro Bowl. Um, like I said, we don't name names. Like we're not gonna go, we're not gonna rat, we're not gonna tell, we're not first 48. You know, maybe he plays for a team in the Bay Area. I don't know. Oh, okay. You know, maybe he's a guy whose natural position is wide receiver, who just got a big deal this offseason. Maybe sometime that team puts him at running back. 
You know, maybe that team's gone through three quarterbacks this year, yeah. and now they have a quarterback who's pretty good. You know, a tight end who's playing out of his yeah. mind, a defense that's number one in the entire league. Maybe that guy plays for that team. Mm -hmm. Maybe he does. I don't know. I'm not sure. Maybe he got injured a little bit this year and is working his way back. But that person didn't show up. We go, okay, guys, what are we going to do? And we were all like, let's just shoot a three-man show. And I knew I wanted to shoot it because I had a dope blue bomber I wanted to wear. Mm -hmm. So I go there, and I'm ready. I'm, I'm buttoned up. You know, I got my notes, and I'm like, we're going to have a great show. Our first three-man show. Our three-man show, the first one since the we opened up. We're going to see what we could be. And, Chan, you started talking about having crabs. Uh. And I, that's when you had bad teeth still, huh? you know. So your stories weren't even as cute then. <laughs> because, you know what I'm saying? Because my teeth weren't fixed? Because your teeth weren't fixed. Okay. What made you sit there, bro, and say, you know what? I think this is a story we should share with the pivot world, which is truly a huge pivot. You know what, honestly, wherever that conversation was at the time, I was like, we got to throw some fun into it. So whatever triggered that, because y'all know I got stories. Y'all hear more stories than anybody because we're together so much driving a car. Told y'all about three stories on the way over here. I like telling stories. And when it came up, I was like, you know what? Let me bless them with this. Like people always say, you know what I'm saying? You mess around a lot, you funny dude. Like y'all know, I know when I know when I can crank up. And I know even our dynamic. Because what we do, like, y'all started, Fred gonna be sexy. You're an orator and you know how to work your words <laughs> and all. Fred gonna be sexy? And yeah, Fred gonna be sexy, boys. And like, y'all know when I, when That's I start. That's my voice. <laughs> That's my voice. Don't talk sexy to me, Fred. <laughs> I got that text we did first take. I love Fred's voice. It's so <laughs> soothing. Tweet him. Yeah. <laughs> Let him know that. I'm not even passing that message along. But no, and I was like, you know what? So we're having a good conversation. I was like, let me throw a little spice in here. Let me put a little something in here. And it's a true story, and it's damn hilarious. That's why I told you. This is, this is knowledge for people out there. The crab community. <laughs> I don't yeah. think, do people still get them? I don't game. know. I didn't think they got them in those six. I was in Florida, I was running. This is before I met my wife and all, you know, I was running. So she, she understands, she heard the story before. I'm at practice, we warming up, and I don't know if anybody know, I found out later that moisture excites the crabs because they want to lunk her down in your, in your hair. I feel some itching, and I'm like, okay, well, this is not normal. This isn't lice. I thought I could get a little brush and brush them out. They were like, no, these, the little eggs are small. You got to suffocate them. So I had to go home. I had to get a, a bucket of peanut butter, and you got to rub peanut butter all over your man pieces and all around on the hair. <laughs> peanut the, butter, stop. Peanut, bro. bro. Peter Pan. No, no, this was, this, this was Publix brand. I had no money back then. Okay. I, I would, I, and it was smooth, so you can't use crunchy because it's holes and crunchy. <laughs> so I used the creamy, right. and I had to sit there with the creamy right. on me. You are terrible. So I got, a, I got, I got Publix brand creamy. Peanut butter, and they got it ready? I had them? to put it on, yeah, set it there. And then slowly the itch just started stopping because the crabs couldn't breathe. <gasps> you know, the day we went to Tennessee, which, which I, I felt like was a day that was either going to be the end of the pivot, or <laughs> it was going to be a day we all came together. We decided. As a, as a group, because we do make decisions as four, that we were going to do Jana Kramer. She was in Tennessee. It was going to be our first woman. Yep. I said, look, with three black men who are married to black women, we're a show that the culture has gravitated towards, and we didn't have a woman yet. We had never done a woman. And that we were going to make a decision that our first woman was going to be a white woman. Uh, we shot it early on that day uh, at a friend's house. Um, I believe we started drinking wine early on because we were trying to say, well, look, if it ain't going to be a great show, we ain't going to love it. Tequila shots. That, that was later. Okay. That was later, Fred. Got team. it, got it. And, you know, we do the show, and, and Jana comes on, and it was truly one, at least at the time for sure, and still now, one of my favorite shows. It was a show that we, got to, we were able to show people that we, as three black men, as three former football players, could truly sit down with anyone and have a good conversation and a comfortable conversation. And we could give people this safe space no matter who they are. And that was what we wanted to show. Realizing when I had to file and follow through with it, that I had no control. And then I always too, like being alone and realizing that I actually never was alone. Mm -hmm, and right. when yeah. more I listened in church and opened my ears and opened my eyes to it, it was just like, I'm alone, but I'm, I'm not, I've never been alone. Mm -hmm.
-hmm. And he was just waiting for me to, you know, step into the faith and to step mm -hmm. in and, you know, know that like he's got a plan for me and I just have to keep my head up and keep loving yeah. my babies and loving people around me. We end up shooting Hugh Jackson yeah. that day who brings his own tequila, as mm -hmm. Freddie said. And we finished with Taylor Lewan. And Taylor Lewan is the first opportunity we ever had with somebody that sat down with Channing and actually had equal stories. <laughs> yeah. When you look back on that day, Freddie T, other than Channing screaming for me when we're leaving the restaurant because he thought I was going to get kidnapped, mm -hmm. what stands out to you? Well, what stood out for me, Ryan, Ryan, <laughs> is, uh, you know, we, we talk about Jenna, who was an amazing show, an amazing guest. And just her story, just, and just everything about that episode was dope. We were talking about shooting our first woman on the pivot in the middle of Black History Month, right? Mm. We talked about releasing this in February. And uh, I think that was, uh, you know, the, the, the one moment we said, we're not gonna listen to the outside noise. You know, we're building something special. You know, it's, it's certainly gonna be of the culture, or, you know, where it derived, you know, looking at our background, but not only for the culture, it's for the people. It always goes back to the people. And that was one of those moments, I think we had to make a tough decision, but it eventually made us who we became to be as a, as a team and as a unit in terms of decision-making, you know, including uh, uh, Alicia and uh, just formulating uh, those tough decisions as a company. But it ended up being an amazing pivot for us uh, just across the board. But that day in itself, man, I didn't think you were gonna make it. I go back to, you know, busing with the boys and being on that bus. <laughs> <laughs> we started with the wine at what, eight, nine a.m.? It was too early. It was too early. And eventually we make it to to do busing with Will and um, and Taylor. And we busting over Happy Dads. We busting over Happy Dads. We got the the whiskey, their sponsored whiskey, and we just going at it. And you would not shut up. Yeah, I talked too much that day. <laughs> you you talk so much. They were like, damn, good luck editing this. But it was what like a three hour sit down with them? I can't remember. Well, it ended up not being three hours that they could air because I told them to take 30 minutes out. Well, they took some time out, but we, we had such a long day and eventually we made it to the restaurant and had a good time. Uh, but man, just uh, just those early moments, man, just the memories that we've built in this. Uh, again, just something I'm forever gr grateful for and I'll never forget. You know, you mentioned Michael Beasley early on. And I think the one thing I want to tell people is we went through so many different ideas as it came to this show. We wanted guest hosts, we wanted other guests to come back, and there were so many things we went through. And I remember having the conversation though, and I said, I said, I don't believe we can bring guests back if we can't bring back Michael. Because I do think we owe him. I do think that what he did for us in being able to be that vulnerable and bear his soul was truly amazing and it strengthened me as a man to see somebody else be that way and to see some and to give us the opportunity to do that i felt like was such an honor and a blessing channing as you're sitting there what's the moment for you that you recall the most from michael beasley's episode i cried that day mm -hmm. it's when i when the emotions hit me and i started tearing up is when he sat back and exhaled, and he said, I'm tired. But that came after us trying to convince him that human beings care about you. Everybody's not trying to get over on you. We're trying to talk him out of, you know, this place where he was mentally not really trusting people and not really, you know, wanting to be around humans. And when he sat back and genuinely you saw, he said, man, I'm tired. Like, of other people? And that really got to me. That's when I was like, who? This is going to hit people. Because y'all know I'm not the most emotional person. Like, you know, I'm that tough guy stuff's there. But that got me teared up, and that really got to me. And to this day, like I said, I can go where we were. I know the building we were at. I know the floor we were on. I know where my seat was. Because that was a pivotal moment in my life to see a man hurting that bad. I've been trying to find good people for so long. I'm tired, bro. I got... You know what I'm saying? You ain't got nothing left. You ain't got nothing left to give I'll people. tell you this, bro. 
I'll be it. Like, whatever you need, dog. Like, if you just want to talk, like, I, I for sure can't hoop with you. I'll go out there and pass that hole. Like, what we're saying is, bro, like, we want to be those people. Bringing you here wasn't about this. I wanted to talk basketball and hoops. But, dog, folks love you, dog. Nobody want to see you go through this. And at some point, you got to have somebody who don't need shit from you, who don't want shit from you, who want to see you win, man. Like, we don't, we don't do this shit for us. Yeah, like, like you want to build these things, but it's about these conversations. It's about bringing people on here and letting them tell their story. When Freddie said, man, you could tell your narrative, tell that shit and I'll preach it too. What we saying is, man, don't give up and we won't give up. The, the things that you've been through aren't funny, man, and we ain't laughing. I th I'm really grateful though. You shared your story. I think you changed everybody on this set. You definitely changed anything I've ever heard about a narrative about Michael Beasley, bro. And when what we're hoping is that you now pivot to be the best Mike you can be, man. And we appreciate you, though. You know, and thinking about that day, that was the most travel we ever did in one day. I flew the night before to Atlanta. You guys flew that morning because, yeah, y'all, we interviewed Candace Parker. Like, we can't put it out, but we have it. And when she drop her doc, we're going to still put it out. And we're going to act like... Call in the closer. Yeah, yeah and we're going to act like we just did it. I'm letting you know. Alicia going to edit that thing up so good. Y'all going to think we... Y'all gonna think we did it. We're gonna have Channing with new teeth, because I don't think still teeth, bad. Channing didn't have Channing didn't have the new teeth, which I was trying to get to. Channing didn't have his new teeth yet. We started the morning in Atlanta, y'all. From Atlanta, we pack our bags, we hop in the plane, we're going to Fort Lauderdale, we're flying into Florida. And in that, we had plans to do current football players that day. Yeah. And those plans fall through. And so that's the night Fred lines up Michael Beasley, Warren Sapp, and Dr. A. Obviously, Dr. A is the dentistry wizard, sorcerer, that fixed Channing's teeth. Um, there's no way that there's tools for that or that there's procedures that would allow for Channing's teeth to go from what they were to what they are now. There are tools for that. He took it from a two to a four and a half. <laughs> Looking at that day, and I know we say a lot of it, it made the pivot because of what Mike did, right? And that was when we started to get all these different posts. That was when people started to recognize what our spot was, right? Charlemagne comes on our show, I think solely based on the fact that he saw Michael Beasley on our show and what he was able to do. Uh, we went to do, we did Ryan Mundy of Alchemy Health, who was one of my former teammates, because that's what, what this space finally became. And it, made, it allowed us to grow into being a spot where Shaquille O'Neal sits down with us. I want to I wanna give props to you, brothers. Great show, great content. I like how y'all make people show the sides that we didn't know. Michael Ble Beasley interviewed, I, like I never knew that about the brother. So I just want to give you guys props for, you know, doing, doing great work. But then he tells us, y'all not going to make me cry. Yeah. And Fred, and we're sitting there and we're having that conversation and Shaquille O'Neal, at least for the first time to my knowledge, says in front of us, it was my fault. Right? Like, like, I made the mistakes that made me come home to an empty house. Never talk about this, and I'm glad you guys are asking because I don't mind talking about that, but I was bad. Uh, she, was, she, was, she was awesome. She really was. It, it, it was all me. I was just, look, we don't need to talk about what I was doing, but I wasn't, I wasn't protecting her and protecting those vows. So, you know, sometimes when you live that double life, you get caught up in. So um, I'm not going to say it was her, it was all me. Because she was, look, she did exactly what she was supposed to do. Gave me beautiful kids, take care of the house, take care of corporate stuff. It, it, it was just all me. Sometimes when you make a lot of mistakes like that, you know, you can't really come back from that. But she's happy now. She's about to marry a, 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 a fine young gentleman, and I'm happy for her. And we have a great relationship. But as I get older and, and dwell on situations, I can honestly say it was all me. Fred, after seeing that clip, what do you remember about your feelings in that moment? Because I know for me, I was like, holy cow, he just said that on our show. What is this going to do to change the way people perceive him? And selfishly, I was like, what is this going to do for us? Yeah, I didn't necessarily think about the show, you know, when, when he made that comment. 
you know, I just sat there and like, whoa, this is a, a guy who's obviously bigger than, larger than life. He's probably the most uh, recognizable, you know, icon uh, in the past, I don't know, couple, two decades. The transparency, the, the, the honesty, you know, um, just looking at, we always said the pivot, our platform was gonna be a safe space until somebody made it a comment about somebody else that went way left. Uh, we always said the pivot would be a safe space. And in that I was like, all right, this is, this is who we are. You know, this is what we are. And uh, it just kinda, I didn't, I didn't know the, the, the magnitude of it at that particular point in time, but I, I heard it and I was like, wow. You know, we can all be honest, you know, as men and um, just 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 get our truths out, you know, and that it just grew legs, man. And the more after we put it out, you can see it just kind of, you know, it's everywhere, you know, but it, it, it made him seem more vulnerable, which he was even at that particular moment. And people were more appreciative of him. They saw a whole different, entirely different side of him. And, uh, and it, was, it was big for other black men who maybe struggle with, you know, infidelities and, and things that they're going through. But just being able to get out there and, and, and trust us, you know, and how it came out that, at the very end. You know, I felt good being a part of this platform and, and what we were trying to do. Yeah, the, pro the progressions, though, just some of the, the, I would say, the benchmarks of things you brought up and the growth that we had at the moments. You brought up Jaina, just thinking about it. After that interview, I felt as if, hey, we can interview anybody. Because we were all so nervous. AZ was nervous. Everybody was kind of like, who, you know, we in the middle of Tennessee in the woods about to interview this, you know, little white girl. I didn't even know, you know, sing. I, we were listening to her songs. To you try sang to Little figure, Mermaid? Figure it out. I sang Little Mermaid with her. And then it was a point where we were like, oh, we can interview anybody. And then with Beasley, we went into Beasley. Remember, it was going to be a fun interview. Basketball interview, we, super cool bees, haha. Huh? And when we walked in, we all figured out the tone of the room, the tone of the guest. I mean, you had to get him to come on the show. Yeah, and he, yeah, he was nervous about the lights and all. So like, and we adjusted there. And then just bringing up Shaq, I think at that, around that moment, we were shooting so many shows, but around that moment, I think that's kind of when we fell into, you know, our roles. Right around that little range, we fell into our roles and then other people understood our show and where it was, they understood our characters, and we also understood our characters on the show. And that's what it was just, it was a learning curve for us, but I think we took it for granted because things are moving so fast. They talked about all of the all of the kingdoms, all of the great organizations, all of the great men that were brought down by sex, brought down by women, brought down by vagina. When you look at that situation, do you sit back and wonder? <laughs> swag. It's the it's right my, word to swag. use. Swag. It's my, it's vagina. Yeah, I'm glad he did, man. <laughs> I love you to death, but go ahead, RC. They said the dinner. They did tell me about the dinner. I got to take all the receivers to a dinner. Mm -hmm. That's going to be cool. I'm excited for that. It's not going to be cool. No, you know they going to run that bill up? Like 75000 Oh, yeah. You, you mean like the, the, the Louis the 13th you're going to have to buy at the restaurant? I'm, nah, they ain't, ain't doing it for 75 k I ain't going to fake it. Nah, That's, nah, nah. It's the it rookie dinner. It's all of y'all. You the 10th pick of the draft, too. They know you got 20 guaranteed. Wait, what you say rookie dinner is? He thinks it. He thinks it's his decision. <laughs> <laughs> it was so cute. It was so cute. It's time to feel that, that beat. beat. And we go by the boogie. Say that beat in love. I'm going to rock with you all night. It's you in today. Come on, what a fucking hate. Oh, what a hate. What a hate. During this show, everybody's had a birthday. Right, because it's been a year. That's what normally happens in a calendar year. And you know, we got to see Fred's wisdom and we showed my outfits, which once again is immaculate. And yours, it was just all the funny moments. I can't keep my eyes off of them. Is it uncomfortable that the whole world talks about your thighs? Because <laughs> <laughs> your daughter's like black dudes. Yeah. I'm oh, a good well, looking. that's look, true, look, yeah. Look, yeah. You yeah. see the teeth, oh, you yeah, see yeah, the yeah, hair. Yeah, you got the you new know? teeth, the hair, the, the whole hair. thing. Yeah, yeah, I got the whole package put yeah. together, yeah. yeah. He came 69. <laughs> <laughs> you, do you 34 and a half, or what do you do? <laughs> Bro, I need to know, man, you big as shit. This boy crazy right now. <laughs> but we've also always gotten to be authentically ourselves. And we've made friends, like we've made legitimate, actual friends with people that have come on this show to where we all text and we all talk. I think one of our closest friends now is Amari Hardwick. Yeah. 
right? And I remember walking into the lobby to do Shaq, right, to do Shaq's show and coming out of the bathroom and then being like, Omari wants to meet you. And I was like, Omari who? You know what I mean? I was like, ghost? You know what I'm saying? Ghost? And he comes up and he like hugs me as if I'd already known him. And then we get an opportunity to, to do the show and he's truly poetic throughout the show, right? It was like the first time I felt like I sat with a thespian, yes. you know? And he spoke about his wife and picking her and the, the cafeteria analogy, which I still don't understand, right? And, and, and then it ended with you talking about not being able to do sex scenes because of your little man. How do those filmed sex scenes happen? Because I couldn't do it, bro. I'd be rock hard. <laughs> <laughs> would. Probably I would be rock hard. Very Listen, I get rock hard right now with these cameras. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, let my wife walk over here and sit on my lap, watch what happens. <laughs> and, you know, we think about all those things and the opportunities we get to communicate with him and to communicate with people and what we've been able to grow with this show. But I think it's sad, Chan, that with all of that, with all the friends we've made, as close as we are, the first person you ever invited on a vacation with you in Asia to the nudist colony was Kevin Hart. And also too, why in the hell would you invite him? I didn't even feel like that's what you was trying to do. I thought you were trying to get to the point to ask him about, are you ever told about your jokes? Yeah, yeah. I knew that there was a comedian coming. I knew it was super funny. And all I said was, I got to spar with him a little bit. I'm the comic guy on the show. So he's the, he's a, he's does it for a living, one of the best in the world. Huge fan of his. That's another thing too. Some of these friends, we were huge fans of people when they walk in. And people walk in and my jaw drops. Like, I get starstruck at some of the people. But with Kevin, I wanted to spar with him a little bit. And I knew I had the question, but I knew I had to have a funny lead up to a simple question. And he called me out on it. So me and my wife go to a nudist colony. Like, once a, <laughs> once a year, we go to a nudist colony. What's going on? Yeah, that's we go to, that's Yeah, we go to a place where, like, you walk in, everybody just gets naked and walks I heard what you said. I, 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 I didn't know if you knew some, this. Back up for a second. I just, <laughs> I just want to get clarity. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. You and your wife and are free spirits. We're free spirits. Got it. She likes to tan. And it's not like, I'm I'm 6'3", but I just got a 6'3 dick. I don't have a 6'7 dick. Like, uh -huh. it's not impressive. I don't it's know what normal. That means. <laughs> I have no, I don't know what that means. <laughs> and I don't want, I don't want you to keep going. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, no, 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 you know, what you want, like a baby leg nah, to your knee. Yeah, 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 I don't have nothing to my knee. I've never, yeah, my I don't, dick's I don't never feel, seen hey, my knee. Hey, we can stop. It's probably the most talked about show when people bring up me everywhere when I go places. They'll, they'll yell, man, that thing with Kevin Hart was crazy. That's the, mo that's, the, that's the show people bring up the most to me. You talk about sparring and you're talking about friends. You know, I'm a firm believer in relationships. You know, uh, just talking about Pretty Boy Pivot, Floyd, you know, and what he's meant to this show. You know, Floyd likes to think that uh, he's an owner or he owns a part of the <laughs> Floyd show. Floyd is the show. He is the show. <laughs> Floyd you know, is and, the show. And Floyd's been great for us, man. And, you know, just going back in, uh, uh, you know, Money May, he talks, you know, he talks big money. He makes you realize how fucking broke. Bro. You really are. The, the, the jet, the man the said. Pilot, correct. He didn't know. What the A, the A boarded group was in right, Southwest. Right. He said, who is that? And he calls his jet, his pilot from the show. AJ. Hey, what's up? So, yes, sure. so yesterday you guys flew over to Vegas to pick my daughter and mother up and my daughter and my grandson up, right? That's correct, yep. Okay, you know I got, you know, I got, I got tickets for you guys to go to the Super Bowl tomorrow, but I got also, I got Dan, he's gonna go. So I need to, I need you to fly over there because you got to pick some, some, a couple people up. You got to pick some people up for me in Vegas. Is that okay? Yeah, of course, Jim. Yeah, we're ready to go. Tell Dan to get on there also, please. I got you. All, All right, right Jim. All right, thank you. Hey, yeah, Jim. I'm done. That was truly a day we were like, hey, tax brackets are different. They are different, but but and I mentioned Floyd just to really go back because the light that we projected him as, you know, on on in on the show here, you know, with his, with his uh, grandkids and his daughter, you know, his children, you know, and people being able to see him in that light, you know, just going back to our platform and what we've done for ourselves and people and, 
you know, just people around the world, you know, not just here in the States, but the DMs that come from South Africa and Australia and all these different places, you know, it really has to, 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 to make you feel some type of way, right? I always say like, we are not celebrities. Like I, I certainly- Almost famous. Well, almost famous, two L's, by the way. I don't, I certainly don't feel like a celebrity. I don't feel, I'm certainly not any different. And I do believe that this show has allowed me to stay humble. Yeah. One, because I'm such big fans of the people we get opportunities to speak with. And also they often show us that they are in much different tax brackets yeah. than we are. Like I realize when Floyd comes in and he has his, his bodyguards and you know the people, his family and the friends that are with him, it's like, yeah, I'm not that. When we go to interview Alex Rodriguez and we go to his building, this office floor, you realize, oh, okay, like this is on a different level. Or when you scramble for a weekend, you fly Spirit to get to New York, you get a car to Baltimore to go speak at Cam's event, you come back, some of, some of us go to weddings, others, of, others just go to the reception, and then you finally sit down with Mike Tyson. And, and you walk in and like, there's the Floyd type of boxer. And then there's the Mike Tyson type of boxer. And I remember the fear in interviewing Mike Tyson wasn't a fear of not being good at my job. It was a fear of like, if I say the wrong thing, <laughs> I don't know if I'm gonna end up like Stu on the hangover. <laughs> and you know, Chan, for you, was it the fact that one, we had a photographer that was in every single shot that Mike Tyson was in. Yeah, yeah we had right? a rough one. We, we, had, we had a rough one. Matt, Matt couldn't come to that one. Matt recommended somebody else. Not sure about Matt's ability to recommend. He was a star, though. He was a star. He was, was on the he, camera. Hey, he was on the pivots, <laughs> right? Then we lose two cameras, yes. right? So, so now we're scrambling, and Alicia though amazing at her job. I truly believe the best at what she does, probably the worst, not at handling adversity, but in the emotion that adversity gives her. <laughs> That's a right? great way to And so it. we're basically like, we're not gonna have a show. Yeah. And then we put out this big disclaimer like, hey guys, due to the mushrooms and weed that floated around the interview, it's gonna be a little different. But we do that show, man, and it's amazing, and Mike loves us, and we have all these things. When you think back to that day, wait, by the way, we met Mr. Mayhem. Yeah, in We the met lobby. Mayhem in the lobby. In the lobby. We should have knew what that day was going to be like anyway. Freddie T, now, do you remember more Big Mike or Lil Mike, too? Because, well, Mike refused to wear underwear. <laughs> yeah, that, that, was a, that was a Channing situation <laughs> between yeah, yeah. he and Mike. You know, and even with that, as hard as we tried to post-production pivot and make that thing work, and I think uh, the team did an amazing job. Oh, amazing. You know, we were shadow banned because of some of the choice words we decided to put up with the mic tossing me the shrooms and the edibles, and it was a drug fest that day, <laughs> you know, to say the least. But, uh, you know, just, just sitting there in, in total admiration, you know, of, of Mike himself. You know, this is a guy who, my childhood, you know, I, I cried when he lost to Buster Douglas. You know, and I had to make sure I, I talked to him about that. But the way in which Mike has, um, he's pivoted in his life, you know, the, 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 how smart Mike is and how above life he is. You know, it, it taught me something that day. You know, how to deal with adversity, how to, you know, really just go on and, and, and just enjoy your life regardless of the naysayers and all these other different things, man. Uh, just a special moment, probably one of the most special moments for me, you know, while we were we 100 shows in or something like yeah. that. Just a special moment for me and, and finally landing Mike and, and, and fighting through those different adversities throughout the, the show, wanting to make sure we said the right things and respect you know, his time and space and not get our ass knocked out in, this, in the same <laughs> sense. In defeat, we find out a lot about ourselves. Would the fight against Buster be your one fight that taught you the most about who you are and where you were headed? Or was it another fight? 
No. You only get lost six times. Listen, fighting Buster was one of the best things that ever happened to me because I was so stressed out being the champ. I, my hair was falling out and everything. <laughs> and so I put a line and make it look like a championship belt. <laughs> I, listen, I know your guys know when your first start, everybody putting a lot of pressure on you to be the man. Man, shit, my hair was falling. I was stressed right. out, but I was playing out like I was still a hard guy. Scared to death. Just something to look back on and say, Check mark. That's a check mark item. Meeting Mike, being offered shrooms by Mike, you know, seeing how cool of a person he was, yeah, how smart of a person he really is at the very end of the day. And just developing that that chemistry and that and that friendship and just looking back on it all, man, and, and the pivot is a bit. <laughs> but speaking of Mike, RC, you always thank people for their time and walking into people's lives. Like, you walk, we walk with, in with Mike, and Mike had the shrooms. Mike had his joints. He had his, you know, Mike 4.0, whatever it is. Like, that's what he does. Seeing Kevin's team around him when he was there, stylists and assistants and, and me, multimedia people, seeing those people. Going all the way back to Jamarcus Russell and Ryan Leaf and their stories of, you know, that Redemption. failure and all. Just coming into these people's lives, even if it's for an hour and a half, is the blessing that I'm talking about. Just being a part of this show more than the business side, more than the content, more than what we're doing, uh, us trying to you know, make, a, make, make great content for everybody, make a great show, is that hour that now the camera's up, now we're sitting here with a very successful person with a with story, with information, with just 100 questions going through all our minds and them really giving us that time to step in their life. Being up in Michael Rubin's spot, all that stuff, being the Floyd's mansion, like all those times there, just, just meeting special people. I became the newest member, well, kind of, of The Pivot about a year ago. And a year ago, if I would have had ZipRecruiter.com, maybe I could have put a team together that is as good as Fred and Channing already were, and then they added me. ZipRecruiter.com is the place to find anyone you're looking for for that special business or personal match. Dietitian, trainer, nurse, they're all there. And listen, four of the five businesses that go to ZipRecruiter.com find a perfect match within 24 hours. And so that's ZipRecruiter.com slash DraftKings. And no matter where you are, they are the place to be. And we are no better than the people we work with, whether that was Shaquille O'Neal, whether it was Kevin Hart or Mike Tomlin. It's the people that surround you that make you exactly who you are. So go to ZipRecruiter.com for all of your business needs and you will find your perfect match. Again, that's ZipRecruiter.com slash DraftKings. You know, you mentioned meeting special people and I think we all have certain moments that are our favorites for different reasons. All of our guests are big to us, to us but we do understand branding. We do understand subscribers, viewerships, numbers, all of those things matter when you're trying to build a brand, but also stay true and authentic to what you want to be. When you look at underrated guests, I don't think anybody made us laugh more. I don't know if anybody gave us an opportunity to learn more about hosting a show and allowing people to feel like a part of the show than Charles Haley did. You know, it was one of the best days Underrated. that that we had. And we did a ton that day. That's the same day we shot Micah Parsons and Michael Irvin before a Dallas Cowboy football game, yeah. playoff game. It was just one of those weeks where you, when Charles Haley stepped in, I didn't know what to expect. When you saw him walk up and team issued, why he has like fresh team issue a gear, I don't know. Because he Jerry, played a very long time ago. Jerry watching out for him. Ashy feet. Yes. Slippers. Yeah. And right away shooting at us. What's your memories, man, of Charles Haley? That was one of the most surprisingly funniest moments, honestly, in my life. Expecting to have this old curmudge. I'm thinking about the old dude going to walk in with the walker and the cane. He walked in, and first thing he said was something to the fact of, who's that bitch over there with the long hair? <laughs> and I looked around and was like... <laughs> Oh, Charles is speaking of me. <laughs> and from that moment forth, he was just shooting and to have that OG, the, the, the monster on the field we saw, but seeing him old, that's what I'm talking about, stepping into his life for a little while, seeing what he does and hearing his story. Like, that was one of the most surprisingly funny moments. And a lot of crap happens. All these stories I tell, that hour window was just, I was on cloud nine just laughing. That whole show, 
Alicia had to edit me out because I was laughing the whole time. They had to cut my mic off because I was just dying laughing at this old bastard making fun of us and really killing my ass. So why did you come in on fire already talking about, you talking about Channing hair? The truth will set you free and I freed y'all. And now, <laughs> now you wanna... I feel like that's a hard way to make friends. Do you have a lot of friends? No. He got a man with them tight pants go with it, dog, man, I don't know. Charles. When I look like you, I dress like you. Bruh. Until then, you know as long as hey, as long as I look like you this, you dream as, about looking like me. You have me. to go work out. You have to do regiments to, to try to be a man. I am a man. Y'all two should switch, man. Them white teeth he got, the, you know, them bleach white teeth blinding me, man. I don't know what's going <laughs> on. Hey, that's Invisalign. <laughs> some furniture gonna move at some point. So if his teeth are white, what color are my teeth, y'all? Mother of pearl. Dog. <laughs> hey, dog, yellow. Ah, oh, yellow. Yeah. Ah, yeah. Like a dog. He oh, said, oh, yellow. yellow. Dog, oh. I got a golden retriever in my mouth. Uh, no, you got mustard in your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. Oh. Well, you know, I had to ask him at one point, was he a slave, though? Let <laughs> say, he didn't know Spanish was a language or something? <laughs> Where did you come from? He's, yeah, he's like, I had never seen one that looked like him. Where did you live? <laughs> hey, why, didn't, why didn't you take that moment and, and have a toe competition? Because you got on his feet, right? Yes. Why didn't you pull your feet out there? When I pulled my feet out, you see, my foot was well manicured. Other than the patch, it looks good. It's ashy. He's, we say we're the old uncles that people don't have. Uncles have uncles. Charles Haley is the uncle's uncle. Yeah. And he's the dude that I would love to sit down and have a damn case of, case of happy dad with. 100%. Freddie T, you know, you, we always look to you for the wisdom, right? You have um, often, and in many shows, people have come, come up in the comments or said things to us as well. And it's just that Fred listens and in listening, he sets up questions to make people comfortable and then allows them to be open and vulnerable. For, for you, what is the, the one show, the, the one guest that you feel like moved you to a point where you not only learned, but the things that you learned impacted you in a way emotionally that it made you want to be better? It always goes back to uh, Michael Beasley. You know, I, I, that, that hit home. You know, just to see there and to see how, you know, a, a young person was manipulated. You know, you're talking about building support systems and teams around you, but how everyone took advantage of him. And you can clearly see the hurt and him reaching out. But what he has to understand is his message is so much more powerful. But all I want to do is play basketball, basketball and let, man. Bro, let's funnel it, though. Like, like even, even doing this. Bro, right here, this is a lot. It is, but it, this it, is a lot. But like bro. I said, it's it's, it's, it's ref people need to s hear this. You know, I, I think more than anything, even regardless of all the guests that we've had, we recently did a show. Uh, it was a three three person show. You know, I always tell you how how great you are at what you do. I see the hustle. I see how you move. I see how you prioritize your life. Um, to be honest, bro, you touch me when you're talking about your daughter. You know, how you emphasize, how you put emphasis on family. You know, how you make sure you're there for Jordan and his graduation. You know, how you talk about Yunk and in spite of the, all the things we go through as, as men, you know, with our relationships, you always show up. You're, you're constantly there. And when I listen to you, you don't always see this because I don't always say it, but you make me a better person without even uh, speaking about it, right? So I think one of the, um, you know, one of our episodes that touched me more than anything else was how you were, you know, display selflessness and vulnerability. And when you shed a tear, you know, that, that really touched me. Uh, I just sat there and uh, I put myself in your shoes because it's not easy being a father, it's certainly not easy being a black father. Uh, especially to your, your baby girl. And I've said it a million times, man. I do not think parenting is a reciprocal relationship. I do not think that my kids got to love me because I love them. I do not think that my kids are going to respect me all the time because I take care of them. I do not think that my kids are going to see me the same way that I see them because my kids don't have to take care of me. I am not their responsibility ever. But there have been so many guests that I've learned from 
But uh, in terms of how our friendships have developed since the, we started, I look to you for, in terms of making the right decisions. And uh, not always gonna get it right, Hell no. but trying to. And, and I'm not just saying that because, because you're here, but I really value um, when you chime in, when you say, oh, I'm gonna leave the business stuff to you guys, Alicia, <laughs> Johnny, and Freddie. I try that though. No, you try it. <laughs> but when you're in a jack, you know, and, and, and it just bring a, a, a different approach and thoughtfulness. You know, I'm like, oh, we were gonna miss this, but I'm glad you chimed in. You always have something great to say. And uh, I've learned to, to value, you know, your opinion, no matter what that is. Um, so I, I figured I'd let you know that. I, mean, I appreciate that. You know, I think, one, I didn't plan on doing that, that show. Uh, the show was over, actually. And we sat down to talk about Thanksgiving. So that was an accident. Um, that wasn't anything I wanted to do. But it's always from here. Yeah, no. So it's never really an accident yeah. because I think that's where this show has taken off to. Yeah. That transparency and being from here. And I think people appreciate that because all of the shit that everybody that's out there watching week in, week out, or of the however many subscribers we have now and views we've gotten, like people deal with shit every yeah. fucking day. Yeah. Right, and, and, and being able to give that back without a hesitation, without, like you said, that wasn't meant to happen. Michael Beasley wasn't meant to happen. A lot of these shows we've done, they weren't meant, meant to happen that way. But when you back out and you look at, you know, the outcome and how many people it is gonna help, I mean, I would not want to ever miss an opportunity to sit down with y'all two and make some fucking magic because you n never know who you're gonna touch. And that's what it's about. You wanna talk about making magic? You talking about something that changed, and it's a weird thing that I would say bettered me in a, in a, good, in a very good way was Caitlyn Jenner. Mm. And it was weird, it's there's so many, and this is just for like a life, like it was almost a life lesson. What's that, brother? Can I interject? What's that? The Rams are happy. The Rams, Rams are happy. <laughs> Bro, <laughs> hey, driving up that mountain yes. or whatever it was. The scariest moment. Thinking that we're going to die, mm -hmm. right? That we're not going to make it. And you being sleepy and only waking up every 20 minutes to say, the Rams are happy. We just did Eric Dickerson. <laughs> we, we just did, just the, did rookies, the, young, the young boys. Whitworth. Yeah, you know, Whitworth that's why we were out there. And we found the whole, out the night before that Caitlin was available. And I didn't want to do it. And everybody was a little on edge. 12 hour turnaround. 12 I think hour we found turnaround. out around 10, 10 p.m. Yes. And we shot at 10 a.m. And we're all like, we don't know what's gonna happen because back to the point, there's so many differences. There's so many, much unknown. There's so much celebrity there. There's so much you knew about her, but you didn't know about her, the political side of it. Like there was, and I was the dude being like, hey, it'll be fine, let's ride, let's ride the hill. Let's go up the hill. But even in the back of my mind, I was like, who? I don't know how this is going to work. And I think it bettered me because as you sit down as humans and look somebody in the eye and start talking to them, those differences, I don't want to say left, we didn't change each other's opinions, but I understood her better. I understood the transition. I understood more about a, a section of life that I never knew I'd be able to speak to. And I bring it up a lot. People are like, really? That's, and everybody says, like, what's your favorite? And I don't say my favorite, I don't, I don't think I have a favorite show. I have shows that touch me in different ways. And Caitlyn Jenner, I, th I think that made me a more understanding, better person. I'm not your typical guest for this show. Yeah, yeah, which I think is good. And I think it's great, because you can learn a lot. Yeah. Uh, but you have a lot of athletes on, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of different people. I only, and there may be more, but I only saw one female on. We did Jana Kramer, uh, we did Dr. Amira, who, yeah who did his teeth. His teeth were so bad, Caitlin, before. Caitlin. His, te his teeth were these so bad. These motherfuckers pretty now, though. And so. Gorgeous. But you mentioned, though, that we have athletes. Well, one of the, the, the main reason the world knows Caitlyn Jenner is because at one point, she was the greatest athlete in the world on, on Wheaties boxes. Put it this way. I have the greatest double in history. Olympic decathlon champion and glamour's woman of the year. <laughs> hey, <Another one>. hey. 
<laughs> Come on. Uh, you'll never get another guest who has those credentials. Yeah, I think in the other piece of it, when Caitlin mentions being Bruce, winning uh, the Olympic gold, getting the moniker of being the world's greatest athlete, but still being naked in the mirror with your, with your gold medal on and not being fulfilled and not feeling like yourself. I think no matter if you are a man, woman, no matter how you see life, no matter what community you put yourself into, we can all understand not feeling like ourselves. And to have Caitlyn share that moment with us, I thought that was huge. I think another thing that people probably don't know about our show is that we actually cannot get everybody in the world to do the show. <laughs> we don't have this booker that gets people to come on our show. We don't pay people to come on our show. We literally reach out to friends. I DM people, you DM people, Fred DM, DMs people. Alicia uses her entire catalog that she's gained through her endless work yeah. in the media to get people on the show. You're an L pivoter, the epitome of the pivot. What's been your greatest pivot mm. in life? Coming from a situation where I think where uh, sports was not my main background to um, playing a sport that people see as a lot of times brutal, which it is, but it's controlled aggression, to, to being on a show where you we were talking to America, you know, the mothers and the grandmothers and the daughters and, and all that to now delivering what goes on to the in the world to everybody. I think my entire life has been a pivot. And so I got to see Method Man get older. I got to see Jay-Z, Ice Cube, Snoop Dogg, Fat Joe, right? And it's, it's scary because it seems like with the youth, they're not never going to see their, their, their legends get older. You know, and so what you need to understand is that Anytime somebody that looks like you, speaks like you, comes from the struggle you come from, maybe even worse, makes it, it offers hope. You know, I always had this conversation with my father as far as, you know, Cam, man, you letting yourself go, bro. You need to, you need to kind of reel it back in. And, you know, I'm like, what does that mean? Man, hey, cut your hair. Cut. And I said, well, my purpose is to empower and, and impact people. And the people in my community look like this. So... If they tune in to pivot, they could see a figure who looks like them, who has the same cultural values as them. I believe I owe more of a due diligence to stay the way that I am, to represent a voice that will never be heard from. And I will say for me, man, the things that I've loved the most is, and it's not that like when I get to meet new people, I don't enjoy it, but it's Raheem Morris, right? To for it to be the Los Angeles Rams Super Bowl parade, and he's waiting at his house for us, and they're like, hey, you know, let's have a good time and let's do this show. And he, we call Eric Weddle during the show, or Raheem takes us through how great Aaron Donald is, and he talks about Jalen Ramsey and just all these people that he's gotten to work with. Mike Tomlin, right? We, we go to Pittsburgh and we shoot Mike Tomlin. I fell in love. Why'd you fall in love, Chan? Bro, you don't understand that man is an angel. <laughs> he was created different than us. <laughs> Just to see a black man in his position, the, the, the role model that I wanted as a child, to be honest. Wow. To go back to be to 100%. Strong, black, smart, together, married, kids, big house, successful, degrees, into education, like, why can't you be my father? I joked about it, like, why couldn't you have me? Like, why didn't you meet my mom? Like, but just to see that success, and you know, cause you played for him, see, he's spoiled by it. He radiates success. Leadership. Leadership, just a front run. I taught you the lion, you know, like, not physically lion. Like, I could, I think I could beat up Mike Tomlin, <laughs> but as a man to walk into Tomlin, like I even took a seat back, cause this is a, this is an alpha alpha. No, I'm an alpha. It was his room. This his is house. his room. Yeah. This is his house. We didn't go to the bar until he invited us to his bar. Mm -hmm. Like that, 
feeling is something I don't get around a lot of men. I get, I get it around y'all, but I'll be honest, it was a different level when I was around Mike Thomas. Wait till Raheem sees this. You mean to tell me you I two was, I was drunk, drunk, show drunk. a level of respect <laughs> for Coach T, a black man who's uh -huh. very successful, yeah. and you got Coach Raheem Morris, who should be in that coaching cycle. I feel exactly right? the same he, about he, Raheem. I but do you but, didn't. The, but the Fred, photos don't show but that. But Fred, but before and the Raheem, great wine on the floor, damn sure. But don't before show Raheem got home, that. I was on. I was in the back, jumping, jumping on with the, the trampoline kids. with the babies. At that moment, I was just Uncle Chan at the crib. Yes. When we walk into Mike's house, it was time. It was work time. I respect Raheem just the same. I ain't gonna lie to you, man. That Raheem Mike, was Mike stole my soul. I told him, like, whatever you need me to do, I'm, I'm, I need you. You got me. We cultivate that talent. We 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 elevate that talent. We provide the stage for that talent to show itself, and them dudes go out there and do that. And together, man, our families eat. Yeah. You know what I mean? I'd have been a Hall of Fame if I played for you, Coach. God damn. I, I, played, yeah. Cam, I played for Cam Cameron. <laughs> <laughs> hey, dude. Hey, dude. Hey, dude. Hey, dude. Hey. I, 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 lost, I lost out on that Dolphin job to Cam Cameron. <laughs> yeah, because you were too hip hop. <laughs> That's what I hear. That's what I hear. In thinking about the coaches we've gotten the opportunities to speak with, and hopefully we'll get to do more, I still believe the most ambitious idea we had was the training camp tour. Yeah. I thought it was ambitious to think that we could get in that many buildings. I thought it was ambitious to think that that amount of players would be willing to sit with us and ambitious that we could actually do it, right? We, you were, we were away from our homes. We were away from our lives. And we were also flying by the seat of our pants. It wasn't that we had all of these things lined up and we knew exactly where we were going, going to go and exactly who we were going to, to interview. And it turned out, bro, we ended up having more interviews than we could actually release. Right. I remember being in Cincinnati and we're in Cincinnati and we're super excited about this because we got the trio of wide receivers. We got T Higgins, Tyler Boyd, and obviously Jamar Chase. And we're sitting there and we ask, okay, like, What's the team? Like, like, who's the guys? And they straight up, like, Cleveland, Denzel Ward, like, right away. And we're like, we got to get Denzel Ward. But we're going to Pittsburgh. And then we get to Pittsburgh, and it's like red carpet. Obviously, it's Mike T. We're on the field. We get TJ Watt, and you get Najee. But then we're like, and then Leach is like, nah, we got to go to Cleveland because we got to let Denzel Ward reply to what the Cincinnati guys say. And we get an opportunity to do that. And then you go to Tampa and you get, then we get Saquon. And while we're getting Saquon, we're like, oh, shoot, Atlanta's here. Let's do Atlanta. And we're doing, and we're getting all of these different guys. And it starts in Detroit with Jared Goff, you know, and, and you get AG and, and Hard Knocks is there. And we're talking to Dan Campbell. And I'm starting to like slowly realize that, hey, man, like they really F with us. <laughs> you know, like me and Freddie get an opportunity to speak to the Cincinnati Bengals defense. And you're getting to this point and you're like, nah, man, like people really fool with us. It's training camp and Saquon Barkley sat with us for an hour. Yeah. And we got to watch him and Fred talk like X's and O's of the running back position. And it was one of those moments that make you proud of your friend because we all know who Saquon Barkley is and he's number two overall pick who's going on to have another amazing Pro Bowl season. But he's hanging on to like every one of Fred's words. When we're doing that tour, Fred, and, you know, now we're waiting for when you get into the Hall of Fame. You're doing that tour, but you're watching the way that people are responding to you and players are responding to you. What sort of pride did that and, you know, make you feel in knowing that your work is respected in that way. Really, that's what it's all about. You know, it, it makes you feel a sense of, you know, we're not doing this in vain. We ain't doing this just to do this. You know, what we set out to do it for, we're actually um, getting that. You know, we're getting that result. Uh, but it, it, it drives you. It, it makes you want to do more. You know, and, and these young guys don't realize how much of a fan we are of them. You know, how much we appreciate them. And not just the opportunity to sit down, but the opportunity to go out there and, and root for them. 
you know, and, and, and not being messy, not being dramatic, but we sincerely want to see or we want to interject into their lives, but also see them respond and go out there and have success in every aspect of their life, not just on the field. Uh, so that development, sitting back, being that big unk, you know, and, and seeing the results is such a good feeling. And, and just seeing how Saquon responded to when I said, uh, it's about you proving to yourself that you still got it. Mm-hmm. And we see that clip everywhere. And I wasn't saying that to, to, to make a viral clip. It's really what I believe in. You know, and to, to see him go out there and respond and have the type of season that he's had and hopefully it translate to, you know, the Giants securing him as the, the their franchise, you know, star, you know, for the next five, six, seven, however long years. That's the result you want. Uh, but, man, just appreciative of, of his time, you know, of all of these guys' time and allowing us in their building. I really think that's a, a testament to what we believe in and what we set out to do as a team. And in in my two seconds of being messy again, we ain't copy no fucking body and we're never going to do that. <laughs> so <laughs> I, no, that's that is that is that is very true and I think those two things played out. And let me give Alicia her shout out, right? Because this was already the vision was already aligned. We just needed a moment to bring it to fruition and 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 really that big pivot you know, having a moment to do it on our platform, something that she can call her baby. You know, I, I think it's a lot more special in that, you know, that we were able to do it our way. Yeah, I think, and, uh, and we mention her all the time. At some point, Alicia's actually going to have to get in front of the camera, which she I know. She should have been here right now. Yeah, which I know she, she doesn't want to do. I, and thinking about that tour, man, you know, the, the same way you felt when you sat down with Mike Tomlin or when we sat down with Mike Tomlin, it's very rare, I think, we sit down with players that make us feel that way. When Devontae Adams sat down with us that day, and it was one of our shorter interviews because we did it in between practice. The Raiders were extremely tight with time, and it was a little difficult with the Josh McDaniels thing. When he was sitting there talking to us, I was like, he's different. His, his approach to... Football was different. The way he saw it was different. When he talked about that Terminator mask going down, I remember all of us looking at each other like, interesting. This is different. It's funny you brought it up. The release, like, that's what all on Twitter, Instagram, all the yeah. videos about you yap- yapping them at the line. Yeah. Is it premeditated Never. or do you do you just Never. fall? I, I, got a, I got a plan every time I get up to the line based off of what you're doing, then I put my Terminator mask on. And if you right here in, in, in front of me, I drop down a scroll, three ideas of something that I want to do based off of, and this is pre-snap. So that's when you, the plan B kick in based off what you do. And you know, and we go, to, we go to Tampa and you're in Tampa and it's Leonard. And you spoke about that earlier, just me, us saying that he was like one of us. Then we get Byron Leftwich and we walking around the facility and it's like, man, they, these are places that are opening their homes to us. You know, we finished, the training camp tour and obviously Devontae Adams, you know, was a part of that. And that was huge for us because just the way he approached football, it was so, it was so dang adult, but also meticulous in such a, a killer type way. He knows who the hell he is, you know, but even after that, man, like we're doing all these cool things and we've had all these different people, but Ken Griffey Jr. reaches out. If Ken Griffey Sr. was a carpenter, would you be what you are right now? Yeah. Because of his motivation. Even if he never played baseball, like... My dad, went, he was going to play football. Yeah. Then I was born. You know, most people don't know, my dad slept on a park bench in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, because they went and rent him an apartment. So I had to get on a bus with my mom at like six to eight months old, ride to Sioux Falls, South Dakota on a Greyhound, so they would rent an apartment to my mom. I slept in the top drawer in a one-bedroom apartment. Would the, the apartment wouldn't rent it to him? And, but they would rent to a, a black woman with a baby, but they wouldn't rent to him as a black male. Ooh. And so I slept in the top drawer. And we finally set it up and get an opportunity uh, to interview him. 
and dude flies to us. Not, you know, and he doesn't get a pilot or charter a flight or even buy a ticket to fly to us. He flies his own private jet to do the interview. Own the plane and fly it? Yeah. Gosh, that must be nice. I mean, just to, I mean, just to, to own one. Damn, you sound a little jealous. Yeah, I, I, no, I, I'm, hey, it's called impressed. Yeah. Like, to be honest, it's, it's impressed. My man, own it and fly the plane, dog. Yeah. And he tells our driver, Danny, he tells Danny, he's like, I'm only gonna give him 30 minutes. There's no reason for you to leave. You know, and Danny's like, yeah, Cheech, I'll just stay here. You know what I'm saying? Exactly what he said. And then, you know, <laughs> we're getting jerseys signed and like, he's inviting us down to the house and we're having all those things. And, you know, just to have that moment, the UFC. Yeah. yeah. Right? Like we didn't, we didn't start like at a very low bar on the, in the UFC. We started with Dana White. What was that like? Like, what did you do when you guys make the sale to WME and, and you know, that not only is the business going to keep growing, but now you have just all of this cash dumped on you. Was it like some big UFC party in, in Abu Dhabi? Did you did y'all hop on a, a big plane and you take everybody over? Like, what was the next? It's a great question. And that is exactly what you would think, right? But it wasn't at all for me. It was actually a really bad time for me. I, I didn't want to do it. And I, uh, the Fertitas were ready to get out. And they were like, and here was the thing. They had, the, they had a sit down with me. And they're basically like, you know, we had everybody in here going through the deal. Everybody was in here kicking the tires, looking to buy it from ESPN to uh, Turner to all these different funds and groups from all over the world. And they sat me down and said, we're going to sell this thing and, and we're ready to go. But nobody will take it unless you stay. So you have to stay. Wow. You have to do this. And I was kind of in a weird place because I'd done this thing with them. You know, these are my best friends. We'd done it together. And I got a little f***ed up. I kind of, uh, I took off for a little while, went up into a hotel room and didn't come out for a few days. Wow. Dana White leads to Sugar Sean, Hall of Famer Daniel Cormier, who I have a podcast with. We finished with Izzy. You remember, the, Freddie T, you went to the fight after we amazing. sat down with Izzy. You felt what it's like to become a friend of these guys. Yeah. When you sitting there watching yeah. that fifth round, Freddie T, what are you feeling, though? I just want to say shout out Dana White, first and foremost, to even say how great we were, you know, how, how great the podcast was in its infancy stage. And I felt that was big. He said, man, this is the best interview that I've done. Man, we appreciate you. Ryan usually raps. He's the consummate pro, Mr. <laughs> ESPN. But I'm still in his glory right now. Because I respect it, the f out of you Thanks for everything for me, you man. share. Appreciate it. Now, thank you so much, man. That was amazing, bro. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. Oh, this was fun, man. Yeah. yeah. Man. You guys it. ask great questions. <laughs> I appreciate it, dog. <laughs> try. Yeah, man, that was good, man. <laughs> so shout out Big Dana, Big Boss. Um, but yeah, Izzy, man, 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 that hurt. RC, that hurt. You've gotten me into some shit. Because, <laughs> I, I, I mean, you can see UFC from afar, and you, you, know, you see knockouts, and you see the fight. But following the sport, I, you know, I hadn't done that. But man, uh, I had heard about uh, the last style bender and Izzy and his 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 flair and what he brings to the sport. And after the interview, I'm like, all right, I, I like this guy. I like you know everything about him, his mindset. You know, he taught me a few things in terms of um, you know the, the extra stuff you got to do to be a great in that sport. I thought it was just fighting and. <laughs> You know, so you get there to the fight and the atmosphere is amazing, you know, and uh, he get out there and he's winning. I'm like, yeah, let's go. Let's go. Our guy. And then the fifth round happens. And I'm hurt. And I text y'all and I'm like, fuck. <laughs> it really hurt. No, it hurt. Like, it no. really fucking no. hurt. Everybody was crushed, bro. Yeah. But I don't think if they come on the show or not, they don't still. Does Wilder win? Yeah, he won. Errol Spence. Errol Spence. You yeah. see what I'm saying? But there's some people on the other side that didn't win. Well, that's because we do a lot of shows. But I just think for us, that, that relationship with the UFC, man, has truly been something that I don't think you could plan for. I don't think you know that you're going to be in Dana White's office and you basically release three or four of the biggest fights of the year because the yeah. picture of his board <laughs> is in the background. But Dana doesn't even care. 
right? He, he was so gracious to us. He was so good to the podcast, so good to us as individuals. Like, he doesn't care. He's like, nah, Dana, why run it anyway? Yeah. And so now you get an opportunity to get other fighters and other legends and other Hall of Famers from that one meeting, right? Now you develop that relationship. And think about, too, the... And I don't, I, I truly don't know if people understand as well. It's actually difficult to get women to come on the show. You know, like we tried and, and we've reached out. Uh, and so like, we have to say thank you to the Taylor Rookses of the world. I thought that was, that was a huge show for us in getting an opportunity to talk about the media and, and black women and the way that they're perceived in it, the way they had to move in it to be successful. To have a couple like Aaron Ross and Sonya Richards Ross come on the show and for Freddie T to ask about uh, her abortion before the Olympics and what she was going through and for her to bear her soul. I get emotional even now and it's been how many years? Although Ross and I had been very careful up until that point, you know, it, you know, it happened. And, you know, I'll never forget, you know, having to make that choice. I, I said when I was nine that I was gonna be an Olympic champion. And here I was like on the precipice of achieving this dream. Mm, 10 years later. And yeah, and I find out I'm pregnant right before I have to get on the plane to go to Beijing. And it's like you find yourself between a rock and a hard place. And, um, and so, you know, I go to that clinic um, and I have an abortion two days before I board a flight to Beijing. And it literally feels like you leave a piece of your soul in the clinic, you know? For, for Aaron to say that he's depressed in retirement, but Chan, Tamron Hall, oh, my right? Tamron Hall was amazing. Tamron Hall show is amazing. They picked you to go on the show and the amount of makeup <laughs> you had when you and Asia were on the show, uh -huh. It was truly, Tamron had one who's miles and miles prettier than you are. Tamron had less makeup on our show than you had on your face on her show. I think, I think it, it was, that was manipulation. Okay. Because Tamron wanted to be the finest thing on the stage. If you leave me natural, I got her. So then I'm sitting in this makeup room with this lady that didn't speak good English. And she's piling and piling and piling this powder up on my face. She raised my cheekbones. Something crazy she did to me with this powder. I looked ridiculous. But the Tamron Hall thing was cool. You know, we had a moment where we were able to sit down with, you know, one of your contemporaries, Stephen A. What was that moment like for you? That was a big bro moment. I need to know that first interaction. What happened? Well, he went on the air and was talking about my hairline. <laughs> That's what it was happening. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I'm sitting there like I'm home, minding my business. You know, I mean, I'm off, I'm on vacation, and and some brother come to fill in, and he start talking smack about how you know about my hairline, and I like, he must have forgot who the hell I am. This brother, like, this, is, this is a rookie, a novice. He just getting into this business. So I went on the air the next day and checked him. And I heard he had an attitude. And one of our good friends, Galen Gordon, yeah. who's now a, a senior VP at uh, ABC, he was overseeing First Take at the time. And he brought us together. And I was like, yo, bro, I just came back at you because you came at me. I got nothing but respect for you. And he <laughs> called me up and said the same thing. Actually, it was over the phone. And mm -hmm. we've been cool ever since, man. Thanks. And I think the other piece of what's been great about that is for him to consistently talk about how good this show is. I think it shows how well we work together, how much we respect the people that come on this show. But for the one thing Stephen A doesn't do is BS people. He's not going to lie and say that we did a great job if we didn't. He's not going to lie and continue to support us if we aren't doing the things that he feels like deserves his support. And I think whenever, the same way I'm so grateful for Floyd mm -hmm. giving us an opportunity when he was the biggest guest that we'd had. And maybe still, obviously still is one of the biggest guests. He's, you know, arguably the greatest boxer of all time. Uh, for Stephen A to be in this position, to work as much as he works, but on the strength of a relationship he has with me, as a mentee to say, no, I'll come on your show. And then for us to get an opportunity, because it's us, for us to get an opportunity to show them how well we can do this job, I thought that was just, you know, one of the most important chances we had in the media space to prove ourselves. And, you know, now you think about sitting with Isaiah Thomas. And Isaiah Thomas, 
truly giving us honesty about his relationship with Michael Jordan, right? The, nah, I made sure he was good in Chicago. That's not basketball, but that's only things that get talked about on this show. I was upset of watching a documentary of a guy being an asshole to everybody, but then call me an asshole, and I ain't been nothing but nice to this dude. When Michael Jordan got to Chicago, I made it real easy for him to walk those streets on the west side of Chicago. Hmm. My family took care of him. My sister and his brother hung out as friends. My little nephew lived with Michael Jordan. Wow. BTS moment. If everybody could have been in that room where we shot Isaiah and see the building, you were late, so you didn't see it. This guy and what he's done for the pivot, we did Mike. Mike and, Hollis. And RC tweeted some things because the day didn't go quite how it should have gone due to a big network. Not, you know, they intercepted and uh, didn't necessarily give the pivot the credit that we uh, should have gotten for uh, breaking that story, actually. And uh, he put it all on the line. <laughs> <laughs> you know, to, to hear this guy on the phone with all of his big bosses, all of the big bosses at Disney and ESPN and all these places, and he sat there and said, no, no, this is my baby. This is what happened, and, and this is how we're going to write the ship. And I don't know, I don't want to get you in any trouble. No, I don't think it's, but, like, 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 that's definitely not about trouble. I think it's a, it's a good moment to share what we all mean to each other, because I obviously don't do that for something I don't care about. But I also think it's a moment to share about how we all felt about Mike Hollins. I think, one, we all felt that way because of what the young man had gone through. And I believe I could speak for both of you here, and, you know, y'all could correct me if I'm wrong. When you care about people, if they love someone, you automatically have that sort of attachment to them as well. If for two weeks I'm saying, Mike is this, and I feel this way about him, and I love him, and I care about him, he's all of these things, you can't help but feel the same way too. And I felt like we all felt that sort of protection. We all felt that sort of bond and getting an opportunity to sit down with him. Yeah. And you know, we were going through that headed into Isaiah, but then we get that great gift of one of the greatest point guards, guards, guards of all time, yeah. treating us like we were one of the bad boys, yeah. right? <laughs> Putting us on the, on the group chat, and you know what the group chat is, you know what I'm saying, with the middle finger yeah. stuck up, they don't even speak words. They just... Of course they change the rules for y'all. Yeah. Y'all don't mm -hmm. talk, you know? And I think, you know, you finish this year, man, you get an opportunity to sit with Travis Kelsey and the Kansas City Chiefs, one of the best teams in ball, the true benchmark of what the AFC has been since Tom Brady's left to give you an opportunity to come into their building, man. What we have created in, in one year is something to be proud of, but this is only the beginning. We came back to the same place for nostalgia. I want people to know we will not be back here for year two. It is way too much to do. Beautiful building. Beautiful building. Quite loud. Very grateful. <laughs> Very loud. That's pretty dope. Um, yeah. But... I guess, I guess in closing, we should say to all of our subscribers, man, to everybody who has made the pivot successful, to everyone that has made the pivot possible, we are truly, truly grateful. Words won't express what we truly feel. I don't think these clips or these conversations can truly express it, but I also want to say thank you to my three partners. Y'all didn't have to pick me. You know, we've had conversations about what you guys spoke about before the call was made to me, before I talked to Alicia, before I talked to Chan, before we all got on a Zoom and hashed everything out. It didn't have to be Ryan Clark. You guys had developed a place in this space way bigger than I'd ever had. And you accepting me allowed other people to accept me here. Because just like all y'all really knew of me, from the work standpoint was what ESPN was, so did kind of the rest of the world. 
And now they've gotten to know me through this platform, which I truly think has blessed my life and career, but that's because y'all blessed me. So to Alicia, to Channing, to Fred, I am forever grateful for this. And the reason I fought for it that day was because I fought for y'all. It wasn't just about me. I want to take a moment just to really extend that to, you know, everybody that's behind the scene. When we shoot, you know, on the West Coast, that, you know, a late night show on the West Coast, then we, uh, Alicia send the, she send the files and the footage back east and say, hey, we got to have this show up in Tomorrow. the Tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, to make that happen. So it's a lot of work that goes on behind the scenes, you know, and these people don't always get the credit, but they do the real magic and they make sure the show is, edited appropriately and colored appropriately. The sound is on point, you know, because that Floyd show, Floyd. that sound boy, he was scared. Yeah, he, he ain't yeah. say nothing. Floyd, Mike was down to his ankle and he didn't say a word, but. The good thing about <laughs> Floyd is he's short, short enough that if it's at his ankle, it's still close to his mouth. But no, I just want to, um, you know, give everybody that credit, man. So many hours that, that go into this production. Yeah, you know, man. like Wallow said when he came on his show. Y'all got a big production, bro. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is some, y'all got a million dollar production. Yes, we do. This is a lot of shit, man. <laughs> man, we try, you know, there's a lot of competition out there, bro. You know, and Alicia and the team and everyone behind the cameras deserve that credit, man. And, and when Channing and I, when we were gone, he was in Egypt. You know, I went over to Thailand. You know, Jay Will, Irving, yeah, Drewski. Man. You yep. know, those guys being there and still being able to make magic and make good shows and put good content out there, not for the sake of doing it, but because it mattered and we wanted to keep keep the party going. And because, you know, people depend on this. This is therapy for a lot of people out there watching, man. So um, for me, man, I just love being a part of it. I can wholeheartedly say that. I love hopping on that plane you know, when I can to go make Pivot Magic, man. So I appreciate y'all. Yeah. I got two, two brothers. Yep. Yes. I got a, one that's, the, he done upgraded it. Amiri, Amiri, Amiri. This boy been spending money. Got we, 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 a 20 made, pack we made, in here. We made a check, we made a check or two. $200 <laughs> t-shirt. But, but one thing, y'all are way deeper than I am. I just know good people create good things. Good people create good, Teams, good, good people create good families, good human beings get together and good stuff happens. And I thought I knew from day one and I figured it out as we progressively got closer, but y'all are good people and that's why this works. People make the podcast, to be honest, people make everything. And I'll ride through anything with y'all. Where we headed? Let's go, we are gonna get it done. Well, I think there's only one way to uh, finish the year's show. A great man once said, everything always works out. <laughs> Hold up, limitless, take a stomach cap, pin in it. I thought they here to witness it. Got my people feeling militant. Way I'm feeling, got me up. Uh, on the mission, got me up. Uh, knowing me, I got the key. Uh, on the vision, I can trust. Uh, trust, uh, limitless, take a stomach cap, pin in it. I thought they here to witness it. Got my people feeling militant. Way I'm feeling, got me up. Uh, on the mission, got me up.